it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Razors in the Candy by Brittleby I always hated that old spinster on the corner of Red Bud Drive. When I was growing up and didn't know any better, I used to think she was a witch or a monster or something. I didn't know about crazy cat ladies and alcoholism at the time, so for some reason in my child's brain I just assumed she was cutting up little girls and boys to feed her an army of strays. Well, since everyone in my class was convinced that she was the spawn of Satan, I asked my dad why no one did anything about it. He rolled his eyes as if humouring me and said, Well, nowadays we don't burn witches, we just avoid them. Well, I'd always pedal my bike fast at that corner, ignoring the stop sign and even the honks of oncoming traffic as I steered my lavender cruiser homewards. I remember the fast clickety-clack the playing cards every afternoon as I frantically pedaled to put a safe distance behind me. Well, ten years down the road was enough distance for me to acknowledge she was probably just a lonely middle-aged woman who thought drinking with cats was less sad than drinking alone. Or maybe she was right. I know I'd open a bottle of wine with my dog some of those lonely nights when I was back home from college. And I was content to keep our uneasy truce where I'd return a half-hearted wave at her silhouette in the window when passing. Well, if she didn't try to come any closer to me. Unfortunately, that was something I couldn't do on Halloween. Even back when I was a kid, the only other thing the old lady on Redbud was known for, aside from day drinking and pissing off the local animal control, was her baked treats. Four times a year, she'd participate in the local ISD bake sale, despite not having a kid. Well, the PTA insisted. They practically begged her to provide a tart cinnamon apple pie for the silent auction. Even though she seemed to be kept alive by Jim Bean and Cat Dander, she could definitely bake a mean pastry. And so my little brother was quite insistent that we stop at her house to round out the night of trick-or-treating. I'd driven in for the weekend, homesick and missing my parents. I might even have missed my snotty little brother, Matt, well, yeah, a little bit. They were so thrilled to see me after so long that they immediately took the opportunity to turn me into an unpaid babysitter so they could go to a Halloween party. Well, considering it fair compensation, I'd had a couple of glasses from Mum's open bottle of Malbec to dull the tedious misery of trick-or-treating with my little brother. And it was working, the warm buzz behind my eyes softening the sharp edges of Matt's constant adolescent prattling. I'd tune in for every third or fourth word, nodding encouragingly with a disinterested smile. He was dressed up, as a little iron man, his chest beam and hand lights making electronic humming noises as they illuminated the sidewalk in front of us. It had been a pretty good haul. Matt's bag was so full of candy that he kept shifting it from one plastic laser gauntlet to another when his arms got tired. We were almost done with the last block. Everyone's door knocked on, except for the corner house. Three in the afternoon, and from a safe distance, I'd managed to suppress my childhood fears. But just past nine on Halloween, oh, the old paranoia started to creep back into my stomach. I was trying to think of something I'd bribe Matt with so he would at least let us skip the house, when he made a whoosh noise and ran up the driveway towards the witch's door. I was tempted to write the little bastard off as a lost cause and head home, but he turned around halfway to make sure I was coming with him. The gravel crunched under my sneakers as I walked past the station wagon that she parked there before I was even born. I turned nervously to glance towards the dusty side windows of the dead vehicle. Through the grime, a half dozen cats watched me from the safety of the other side of the glass. I could hear their chorus of rumbling growls, warning me not to try anything funny or get close. There were more of them peeking from beneath the house their eyes glowing from the headlights of a passing car. They paced behind the overgrown skirt of the house, dozens of them having made the foundation of her house their nest. I tried to ignore the army of strays as Matt took the stairs up the witch's porch two at a time. He hopped onto the welcome mat with both feet, straining for a moment to reach the doorbell. As soon as it buzzed, he struck up a pose, ready to blast the lady if she didn't comply. 
The door creaked open ominously just as I caught up with Matthew. It was dark inside, aside from the dull orange glow of the fireplace and flickering blue and white of an old television. Lit from behind, the witch's silhouette was a lanky and twisted thing. Her spine was tilted at severe and horrible angles, as if her back had given out under the sheer weight of all her evil. Only the fringes of her wild black hair caught the light, giving her a terrifying halo like an insect's nest, as she reached out a bony and gnarled hand past the doorframe. She grasped hungrily towards us, her vile claw sweeping up a few inches of Matt's head to take hold of a slender chain. The witch's knuckles popped audibly as she gripped the pull chain tightly and yanked it down. It made a sound like a chicken's neck snapping, and the hanging porch light groaned with a dull hum as the fluorescent bulb warmed up. Matt was frozen in place, just as terrified as I was as the witch let out a laugh that was a moist gurgle. It rose to a hiss deep in the back of her throat, her whole twisted frame shuddering menacingly as the light finally came to life. Oh, hello. Aren't you precious? She gushed over Matt, coughing into her hand to clear her throat. Her voice was less wicked, witch, and more Minnesota mother, as she threw out a friendly, I thought all the trick-or-treaters went home for the night, don't you know? She blended the last three words into a single, don't you know, before straightening up. In the bright fluorescent, I could make out the multiple kittens and the glitter on her faded pink sweatshirt. She smiled a big white tooth smile at Matt expectantly, and it took him a moment to remember his line. His little brain was obviously having trouble processing the sudden change in mood, as he asked, more than threatened her, with a timid, Trick or treat? The vile tangle on top of her head that I'd mistaken for snakes and crawling insects turned out to be a simple bedhead, from where she'd apparently crashed hard on the couch. Her black frizzy hair was matted wildly off to one side in the kind of cowlick you could only get from sleeping off a few too many drinks. The uh, witch lifted her eyes towards me, while my own eyes were watering from the stink of whiskey and far too much perfume. He's adorable. I... Uh... She seemed to lose her train of thought as she stared at me curiously, her smile broadening ever so slightly as if she recognized me. I... Uh have a special treat for the both of you. Oh, just be a moment. She vanished back inside her house for a few seconds, hardly time for the stench of her perfume to dissipate before she returned with an aluminum baking sheet and a thin spatula. With a deft swoop of her hand and a sharp pop, she pried a cookie free. She set down the spatula and held out the prize to Matt. It was a gingerbread cat, the scent of caramel and fresh vanilla cutting through the fog of her boozy stench as Matt took it from her. Oh, the treat was so fresh and soft, I could see it dimple from the pressure of Matt's tiny plastic fingertips. Its fur was lovingly scored into the cookie, chocolate and caramel traced meticulously into the line work. Well, I had to admit that if she ever got tired of being a drunken cat lady, she could probably get a job as a high-end baker. As Matt breathed in almost silent, Thank you. The witch turned her attention to me. Oh, and something for Big Sis. She set down the now empty cookie pan, the surface marred by the burnt outlines where the five kitty cookies had been baked. From the side table, she produced a small brown craft colored rectangular box. Something rattled inside softly as she handed it to me but I noticed, tied to the hand-curled orange and black ribbons on the front, were a trio of small bottles of pumpkin-spiced vodka. The witch didn't let go of the box, offering me a playful wink. Oh, uh, you're twenty-one, right? I smirked and lied with a wordless nod. She let go of the box and offered me a knowing smile before she warned me. Well, a good babysitter needs something to take the edge off. Just have a couple, though. Don't open the big surprise, unless little Iron Man here starts to get out of hand. Then you should open it and thank me for the help. Ah, oh, thank you now. <laughs> Thanks, I replied, feeling a little silly after all these years of self-induced trauma. 
Will you have a happy Halloween, Ms. Uh... I let it hang because, after all these years, I'd never actually bothered to learn her name. She smiled her big, bright smile one more time, brushing cookie crumbs off her kitten sweatshirt as she giggled. I always have a happy Halloween. After all, I'm the Witch of Redwood. I spent the rest of the walk home feeling utterly stupid. I knew the Tooth Fairy and Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny weren't real a decade ago, but for some small, childish part of me, I'd still believe that a sad, lonely old woman was going to eat me if I got too close to her. At least Matt wouldn't have to grow up in this town believing stupid crap like that now that he'd actually met the witch. He was merrily scoffing down the gingerbread cat as we walked, the gummy caramel causing him to smack and chew loudly with each bite until it softened. By the time we got home, he had a little Tony Stark moustache and goatee made of dark chocolate, and I told him to go wash it off. I prepped a cup of decaf, waiting for the Keurig to spit and hiss at the end before emptying two mini bottles of pumpkin vodka into the cup. My buzz was wearing off, and I knew Matt was going to be up for at least another hour, well, from the sugar high alone. He returned from the bathroom with his helmet and gloves taken off, knowing full well he'd need the full range of motion in his fingers if he was going to sort through the candy efficiently. Well, efficient candy sorting went like this. We dumped the bags over, separating the hard candy bullshit from the good stuff, like Ziplocs of cookies and fudge, fun-sized chocolates and big spender full-size bars. For safety concern purposes, we would eat every fifth or sixth piece to make sure there was no THC or razor blades hidden in the Snickers bars. After two peanut butter cups, half a Toblerone, a bag of chocolate cookies, a mini toffee bar, and the third bottle of pumpkin vodka, I was done with the inspection. But Matt wasn't content, and gorged on what had to have been half his body weight in sugar. I sent him up to bed just before eleven. He was wise beyond his years and made me pinky swear not to eat any more of his candy while he slept. Knowing a pinky swear wouldn't hold up for shit in court, I helped myself to the other half of the Toblerone before passing out on the couch. I was awakened by a clammy child's hand pushing on my face. I sat upright suddenly, arms flailing like I'd just woken up from a power blackout at a frat house party. As my bleary eyes focused... I could see Matt was standing by the coffee table, clutching his stomach and sniffling at me. Oh, my stomach hurts. No shit, I replied, before remembering that I was dealing with a child. He was still new to the idea that overindulging led to consequences. And it was better he learned on chocolate instead of booze, like his sister. You ate a lot of candy. Have you taken a Pepto? Matt shook his head slowly, opening his mouth to speak. Instead of words, a torrent of blood and congealed chocolate spilled past his lips and onto my face. I screamed, leaping up off the couch and trying to wipe the gore out of my eyes. I felt my own gorge rise as I tasted the blood and peanut butter, instantly awake and sober. Matt continued to empty the contents of his guts onto the white sofa, and even though I was worried for Matt, my first thought was that my parents were definitely going to blame the couch on me. I carried him to the kitchen as the vomiting subsided. Unfortunately, without that awfulness to occupy his throat, now Matt was screaming shrilly and flailing on the tile in the grip of a seizure. I called 911, rattling off our address while Matt tore his shirt off with a mewling shriek. The dispatcher was telling me it would be around ten minutes as I watched my brother's stomach twist and deform. Something was inside him, desperately trying to get out. Matt's stomach was distended, as if he were pregnant, the thrashing limbs of something inhuman within causing the skin to redden and bulge. He twisted and kicked, desperate for the pain to end. Knocking the sole of his tiny foot against the kitchen table, the box the witch had given me fell over the edge and landed with a thunk and a rattle. On the bottom of the box, written with a playful filigree, were the words, You should open me now. In that moment, I remembered the almost playful way she said that if Matt started to get out of hand, I should open it. Desperate beyond any rational thought, I leapt onto the box, tearing it open. I felt my heart sink at the sight of what she'd packed for me. Inside, nestled on the top of a purple and black tissue paper, 
was a bright orange handled box cutter. In the same cheerful and elegant handwriting were two words. You're welcome. I kicked the box away, shaking my head as Matt squealed and coughed up a dark bubble of blood. He was growing pale now, a blue tinge settling into his quivering lower lip. His stomach settled as his chest rose. Matt had stopped breathing, his eyes pleading as whatever thing was inside him decided to try and escape through his esophagus. He was choking on whatever it was as it tried to burrow out of his throat. Tears streaked down his face, cutting paths through the blood on his cheeks. I reached for the box cutter, the razor blade extending with a soft click as I crawled over to him on all fours. I ran my fingers across his still distended stomach, and the thing shifted at the touch. It retreated back into his stomach, and Matt took in a deep and grateful breath before squealing again. A limb of some kind pushed back against my fingers as if to reassure me that I was in the right place. I didn't want to watch, but I wasn't going to cut Matt open with my eyes closed. He struggled. His little frame was surprisingly strong as I put a knee on top of his chest to hold him down with all my weight. The blade was blessedly sharp and the tissue almost leapt apart as I cut in. Blood gushed from the wound, but I paid it no mind as I widened the hole. I had a sense of deja vu as I finished the two-foot-long cut and I held open the gash. All the thing inside sounded just like the witch's cats, warning me away with a keening growl. It came out head first, a chocolate and tan calico cat, its fur caked in blood and streaks of actual chocolate. The thing had an appalling likeness to the gingerbread cookie version even sporting a single mismatched dot of white fur where stray frosting had landed on the original. It leapt past me and ran out of the kitchen, leaving a trail of bloody paw prints on the white tile floor. I was too busy trying to stifle the blood with Matt's t-shirt to chase the thing. The paramedics were a couple of minutes early, thankfully, but too late by far to have saved Matt if I hadn't opened him up. The police officer was kind enough to tell me during the questioning that Matt was going to be fine, and he reassured me that I'd get to see my parents again once he'd finished taking my statement. I was too broken at that point to even consider lying. I told him everything. I confessed to everything, even stealing Mom's wine. It was only as I finished that it dawned on me that no one would believe me. I was going to be arrested, or worse, committed to some loony bin where my parents would never visit and I'd never be let out. What's going to happen to me? We're done. I got your statement. Your parents are waiting, but I'm going to have a word with them first. What's going to happen to me? I repeated, the strain causing my voice to break as he closed his notebook. You're going home, he replied. I was too wrapped up in my own trauma to notice that the detective was clearly going through some shit of his own. His eyes were bloodshot and dark, as if he hadn't slept all week. He sighed and rested a hand on mine. I'll have to go talk to the other kids. Just wait here until I finish and I'll take you to your parents. Other kids? It was when he said other kids that everything fell into place and I understood. I remembered that the witch's baking sheet had the outline of five cookies baked into it, and I remembered all of those cats on her property glaring at people and warning them away. All of those cats. I knew then that if I ever went by and watched long enough, I'd spot that chocolate and tan calico with the white spots. I never tested that theory, and the cops never arrested her. They hadn't even bothered to question her in 20 years of Halloweens. Oh, what would they put on the report? That she was growing cats out of gingerbread in children's bellies. <laughs> it was insane. No one outside of town would ever believe it. Two-thirds of the townies themselves wouldn't believe it. Like my dad had said all those years ago, nowadays we don't burn witches, we just avoid them. And so... All I can do is warn you. Stay away from the old witch at the corner of Redbud. And if you can't do that, 
at least check for razors in the candy. My house is haunted, but there is a logical explanation. This is not one of those stories where a tragic death happened inside. No one has ever died here. Still, tragedy surrounds the place. The two windows upstairs at the back gaze sadly out every day. No, this is not a story about a house built on an Indian burial ground. There is no one interred beneath the foundation, only in the yard. Rows and rows of tombstones stretch out past my back door to the tree line beyond. My haunted house stands in a cemetery, the cemetery to which I am now the caretaker. My great-grandfather, Heinrich, built this house 117 years ago. At the time, there wasn't a cemetery within 50 miles. When this country was young, the thought of paying someone else to bury your dead as they died was an uncommon luxury. Most took care of their own, and that was the way many preferred it to be. If they had the space, viewings were held in the home of the deceased. Any clocks were stopped. Every mirror was covered to prevent the soul from being reflected back and becoming trapped. When the day of viewing ended, the body was carried out, foot first as superstition dictated. They did this to prevent the corpse from beckoning anyone whom they'd left behind to follow. Your mother, father, sister, brother, husband, wife, or child was brought out to be buried in the yard. Many thought my great-grandfather was foolish, but some, particularly those of means, saw my great-grandfather's practice as a worthwhile expense. The wealthy would much rather pay a gravesman than do the task themselves, and their wealth transferred to his hands. At one point, we were one of the most prominent families in Bradenville. That is no longer the case, and hasn't been for many decades. This is mostly thanks to my father and his drinking. Father was not a good man. He was overly stern and would hit you for speaking out of turn, if he were sober. Heaven help you if you were stupid enough to do so when he wasn't. His addiction and bad business acumen resulted in the first mortgage this property had ever known sometime in the 90s. I was unaware he'd taken out a second one until he was dead and I began to go through his effects and found the notices. The mortgage was eight months past due. That was a month ago. If I don't find a way to come up with $30,000 this month to cover mispayments and penalties, the bank will take everything my great-grandfather built away from me. I would have to sell ten plots and do ten burials in less than a month to make that happen. So far, since moving back, I've done only one. Selling the rest would be an impossible feat for a small-town mortician. Then after, what would I do to maintain the cost? There are only 17 plots left. The work would dry up in time, and the bank will be knocking at the door again within a year or two. I have to find another solution. I worked as a mortician a few towns over until father died. I grew up in the funeral home, and had grown into the trade. It was a family tradition, even if I was unable to work in this place under his tyranny. I intended for it to continue. I moved back here the day he died. The house is much as I remember, if older and falling into disrepair. A small Victorian-style two-story with outdated refrigeration and workspaces in the basement. Two viewing rooms, a washroom, and the kitchen on the first floor. Three bedrooms upstairs. In the largest, two massive windows peeked in semicircle arches like two white eyes stare out at the graves below. In the stress of worry and hopelessness, I spent a lot of time gazing out from those windows. 
every night since I've arrived. I see the thin man walking slowly between the headstones. I remember him well from my youth. In all of these years, he hasn't changed a bit. He's still as uncommonly tall as I remember him being, draped in an oversized coat. On his head, he wears a black felt hat. Even as a child, I knew there was something preternatural about the grave man, but I never questioned it. Not like I do now. When I was young, I used to call him Great Grandfather. Then yesterday, I found a photo album over a hundred years old. It was filled with pictures of the dead, a sort of catalogue with notes in the margin. The final photo in its pages was of the late Heinrich on the day of his funeral. I knew him from the notes scrawled next to the picture. This man who walked between the plots could not be great-grandfather Heinrich's ghost. Heinrich had died fat. Oh, obese would actually be a more apt description. The lank, bony man who walks between the graves must be someone else. The mystery that clouds him troubles me now, nearly as much as the looming foreclosure. Treading softly through the grass, with each ginger step, his feet leave a trail of sickly light in their wake. A bioluminescent trail of glowing green footprints, leading to where he travels to and from as he makes his way through the gates and between the trees and between the graves. Sometimes he pauses to touch a stone, and the stone too illuminates with this pale light. Who is this man who steps gingerly between the stones? like a man sneaking past rows and rows of those in sleep, as though he is afraid the dead may wake. He is a ghost. I'm fairly certain of that. Except, seeing ghosts doesn't usually strike such harsh strings of fear within me. I have seen plenty of ghosts. Mostly, they are the standard fare. Stereotypes that one might expect those whose tragic deaths still resonate in frequencies seen by only few. I encounter them with a regularity that would probably bother another man, but this is how this house has always been. A little girl hides behind the furniture downstairs. Her name is Amelia. Usually you can see her feet sticking out from behind a couch or chair. Two little toddler shoes of vinyl, shiny white. You almost always see where she's hiding. If the shoes don't give her away, the giggling will. Still, you must pretend you are afraid when she jumps out at you. Otherwise, you'll have to hear her mournful weeping seep from the interior of every wall until morning. Yeah, good luck finding sleep with that happening. A disembodied hand may sometimes grab your ankle on the last few steps of the basement. If it catches you, you may stumble, but there are only a step or two remaining, so you won't die from the fall. The ghosts cannot actually touch you unless you give them enough power to manifest. When he clutches your ankle, what you're really feeling is his displacement of that energy. The energy that the ghosts feed on from me is weak, so even when he's able to grip me, it's seldom strong enough to make me fall. It's best to step on the fingers. Your foot will pass through the ghostly form, and the hand will pull away sharply. It will leave you alone for about a month after, until it forgets and tries again. Sometimes a man's head appears in the oven. I do not know his name, but... You'll only have to hear him wail while the door remains open. These spectres, I understand. I can navigate them. They are a part of this house and have been so since before I was born. Their numbers have grown considerably in the time since. I almost never see them out in the yard like I do this man. There's always been something about the man outside that unsettles me even when I'd assumed we were related. 
It's because of this that I have never interacted with him. I can't explain how I know that he's different from the rest. I just do, and I always have known. I have never ventured to even entertain the thought of following him to see where he goes. The very sight of him breeds an instinctual discord from the very pit of me. The rest of the manifestations are parlour tricksters playing games. I would hate to know that once the bank forecloses, someone unknown was being haunted by my ghosts. How would they know to ignore the wide-eyed spectre of Florence in the linen closet? If you don't, you'll wind up needing to replace your towels. Who would teach them? that the thumping of the plumbing beneath the first floor washroom sink is not the house's old pipes, but the ghost of Chauncey, an amputee that haunts the washroom cupboard. Legless and naked, he hides there exposing himself when you open the door beneath the sink. The knobs of his legs spread wide to expose his flaccid penis as he taps on the drain with a toilet brush. You can try to take it away from him, if you dare as I did once. I know now not to bother. He found it again within the hour, and began tapping twice as loud. These are my ghosts, dare I say friends. Well, except the man who walks between the plots. Why should I give them up to the bank? As I sit here, watching the strange ghost stalk the graves, I come to realize that I cannot keep this place in my name by conventional ways. The sadness of this revelation comes to me in waves. I will have to do something awful to raise the money to stay. But what? There's always one way to remain, even after the bank has come to claim this place. No, I mustn't think of such things. I have not yet become quite that desperate. If I stay, I prefer to do so alive, not as some tragic ghost with the story of my suicide embellished for decades by whoever comes after. From behind me, a draft of cold rushes in, bringing with it a harsh, breathy scent of Jack Daniels. Ah, I know this ghost well, though he has not appeared to me since I took residence here. He only has as much power as I decide to give him, and I stopped doing that before the man was dead. I have reserved all of my fear for the man lurking outside, not the one behind me now. His power to hurt me has long since withered and waned. Hello, father, I whisper without turning to look. I can feel his breath on my neck but make the choice to not flinch away. I don't suppose you have any ideas how I can unbury this place from your debt. I just might. His words are slippery, sodden wet with whiskey. I sigh. I'm still gazing out the window as the man turns the corner of a mausoleum and disappears from sight. His trail of footprints slowly begin to dim and diminish once he is gone. One by one, until the world is dark beyond. Some very wealthy people are buried out there, my father says quietly. Lots of them you won't even need to dig. Necklaces, diamond rings, he slurs. I'd start with the morsel, the mus and then, giving up, uh, the ones above the ground. Hmm, that's not a bad idea. The ones above ground, then work your way down. I turn to face him then. His drunken eyes lack focus as they gaze. He is much the same as I remember. His face is gaunt and stubbled. I walk through him as though he weren't there. 
Go away now, Dad, I said. I need some rest. Tomorrow is a big day. When I turn to face him again, he is already gone. I awake at dawn to the sound of Chauncey rapping at the pipe so loudly that it reverberates through every wall. As I take the stairs down, a boy I don't recognize is in the path. He whispers, Please make him stop. Sorry, kid. No can do, I say. Don't worry. He'll get bored soon. At the foot of the stairs, I see Amelia's feet beneath the grandfather clock in the right viewing room. As I pass, she presses her face through the back and through the glass of the clock door. Ooh! I jump in mimic fright. Oh, my Amelia, I say. That was a nice spot to hide. You got me good today. And as the house chimes with her giggles like a string of charms in the wind, I head out the door at the back, taking with me a large ring of keys. I spend the day opening and closing many gates and pushing open heavy doors, and by the time dusk begins to fall, the pillowcase I brought to carry the spoils of my robberies is laden so heavy with gold, silver, and diamond jewelry that it's beginning to tear. I was shocked to find so much, and excited by the spur of discovery, continuing my searches with zeal. I didn't realize how much time had passed. I found myself outside after dark, and completely unprepared to meet the spindly man. As I exit one of the mausoleums, he is there, and approaching in his slow, methodical way. I duck back inside, to hide until he passes. When I think that I'm in the clear, I stick out my head, and as he tips the brim of his dark felt hat, I learn with dread that I have been seen. The man who walks between the stones makes no attempt to hinder my escape, and for the first time in my life, I have no fear of him. Only curiosity. I realize I may have been wrong about him. With the exception of the strange glowing lights and the overly skeletal shape of his face, draped in paper-thin skin, I convince myself that there is nothing to differentiate him from the rest. He is just another spectre following a set routine. Before I realize what it is that I'm doing, I've set the pillowcase of treasure down inside of the mausoleum and shut the gate behind me. I'm slowly following the strange green prince he has created in his path, a glowing trail to guide me. I trail him to a mausoleum, an old one at the back. Last night, I thought he ducked around it, but I realize now he ducked inside. The mausoleum is the massive monument built to inter the bodies of two prominent figures whose names I know well. Braden, etched boldly into the smooth stone arch above the doorway. Could this be the ghost of Edgar Braden himself? He stood within, just inside next to the gate which, with a push, he'd swung open wide. Edgar? Edgar Braden? He nods and gestures an open-handed invite inside, and I enter, disregarding the sinister gleam in his eyes. And this mausoleum is very strange indeed, because it lacks the stone casket I'd expect. Instead, there is a staircase to the left, with the flickering light of hearthfire dancing on the steps. He gestures open-handed once again. This time the invitation is an invite to descend. Honey, is that you? A woman's voice calls from below as I begin, compelled by curiosity to follow the steps down. Edgar follows close behind. What I find at the bottom is a living room lit on either side. To the right, by the gentle, modest glow of a fireplace, 
the electric kind that you can buy. To my left, by rows and rows of mason jars arranged on shelves, each with a slowly churning fog of emerald-coloured glowing light. A woman sits reading in an aged rocking chair before the fire. On the small table next to her, one of these mason jars sits uncapped. She lifts it to sip the eldritch smoke within. The woman looks up at me with a start. Oh, she gasps. This one is still alive, Edgar. This woman, I assume, is Doris Brayton. She rises from the chair, and through her thin night robe I can see scars lacing across her back from her shoulders, tracing down to her waist. I am entranced. What exactly am I seeing? What is this place? She makes her way across the room, leaving the same glowing footprints in her wake until she stands face to face with me. Here she leans in and smells deeply. She takes in a great, massive breath of me before stepping back with a frown. Not this one, Edgar, you dumb idiot, she says. Can't you smell that? She takes in another breath of me. God, he's kin. He ain't even, Edgar replies. He's Mary and Paul Marshall's boy. Well, either Paul or Mary must have been kin too then. Distant cousin, I reckon, or whatever. Oh, we spread so many seeds, whoever knows. She turns to her husband and says, How many times I gotta tell you? I ain't eaten the souls of our relations. Shock sets in then, and I don't move to run. I only stand, eyes wide. She places her small hand firmly on my shoulder, her small, warm hand, still very much alive. I feel my stomach drop. They aren't spectres at all, these two. I can feel her hand. Not ghostly energy, but the flesh of her hand touching me where a ghost would have passed right through. That must have been the feeling I had about Edgar. The mysterious fear of the man who walks between the graves. That, for my entire life, I just could not place. Surrounded by a house that was always brimming with ghosts, instinctively, I must have known that he wasn't the same. They would have to have been living down in this crypt for over a century. It was one of the first erected in the cemetery's long history. Somehow, they both appeared to be in their early fifties. I did not know how this could be possible but it must be something to do with the jars of light. I turned then, and shoving Edgar from my way in the path, took off in a run. I ran up the stairs, outside and back to my house where I locked every window and checked the bolts on every door. The following day, a man comes to the door. When I answer, he says he is a lawyer and he's come to deliver a check from an anonymous donor. The amount on the line is a large sum, enough to save everything. The memo line reads, For keeping secrets, in a flourished, aged scrawl. When the man who stalks the space between the graves passes beneath the window, he has begun to wave, and now I wave back. He is a relative, after all. Not great-grandfather, but related somehow. His feet still leave the vibrant light in their wake. And this is how I came to learn I was a distant descendant in some way to Edgar and Doris Braden, for whom our town is named. Oh, and I think I understand now why my father drank.
So, a couple of short stories there for your pre-Halloween entertainment. <laughs> so yeah, uh, short ones tonight because I'm working on a biggie for Sunday, as you may have realised from last weekend's video. Yeah, so um, a story that I co-wrote, three hours plus long, coming on Sunday evening for your Halloween spectacular entertainment. <laughs> Hope you all enjoy it. So yeah, that's what I've been working on. That's why uh, a short one this evening. You're going to forgive me, aren't you? Of course you are, because I'll be back again very, very soon with a massive brand new story that's never been heard anywhere in the world ever at all, in the slightest. You're tempted now, aren't you? Of course you are. Okay then, my dear friends. Till the weekend. Very, very sweet dream. Some bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.